Professor Heinrich Focke was a very brilliant aerodynamicist, a very, very great pioneer, who started with the autogyro and then built up his know-how of rotary wings and the lifting and the vibrations and the capabilities. And from there, it was almost a natural step for him in 1935, 1936, to attack the problem of the helicopter, which he very successfully attacked. It resulted in the building of two small helicopters. The two main rotors of the Fock helicopter were side by side. There was one on the left, one on the right. And by rotating in opposite directions, one counteracted the torque of the other. And it had a small propeller in the front that looked like an airplane propeller, but was actually just used to cool the engine. But it was a true helicopter. Heinrich Falke had built the world's first real helicopter. Although it was difficult to fly and maneuver, it could hover, fly sideways, and fly forward or backward. But for all the amazing feats that Falke's FA-61 helicopter achieved, it had little impact on a public already familiar with airplanes and autogyros. That is, until the attractive and daring 25-year-old Hanna Reich, known throughout Germany as that nation's first woman test pilot, climbed into the cockpit. Her flights and her demonstration flights uh, were highly publicized, and those public demonstrations, I think, were pivotal to the cause of the helicopter. In February 1938, Reich demonstrated the Falke helicopter inside Berlin's cavernous Deutschland Halle Sports Arena every night for three weeks. She flew from a court about the size uh, of a basketball court and would take off, fly, hover, turn 360 degrees, and when the films reached uh, the United States, I think they also uh, created a tremendous amount of interest in the helicopter here. And Heiner Reich, interestingly enough, is a member of an organization that I'm a member of, which is the International Women Helicopter Pilots, um, more commonly or better known as the Whirly Girls. And because Hannah Wright was the first woman to ever pilot a helicopter, she's considered Whirly Girl number one. And presently, we have over a thousand members of the Whirly Girls, and all of them must be rated pilots, and they're from 28 different countries. As Hannah Reich continued to break virtually every helicopter world's record, an American-Russian immigrant, Igor Sikorsky, was about to change the course of helicopter history. Igor Sikorsky was no stranger to aeronautics. By the mid-1920s, he had built one of the most successful airplane companies in the world, Sikorsky Aviation. In 1929, the company became a subsidiary of United Aircraft, giving Sikorsky time to pursue a lifelong dream helicopters. Sikorsky's sketches resulted in a unique design for the time period, a single main rotor. Up until the late 1930s, most helicopters that had lifted off the ground were either coaxial in design or had at least two main rotors, such as the Fokker helicopter. On September 14, 1939, Sikorsky began cautious flight tests in his single main rotor VS-300. He kept his craft tethered to the ground while he slowly worked the kinks out of his design. Concentrating heavily on how to control his craft, Sikorsky focused on a rear tail rotor configuration. He tried everything from no tail rotor to three tail rotors. He was trying to obtain some of the other control movements of the helicopter with these other rotors. He finally got rid of the rest of the other ones and ended up with a single tail rotor back there to counteract torque and also to give the, the pilot control of rotating the helicopter to the left or rotating it to the right. But for Igor Sikorsky in 1940, creating this design concept did not happen overnight. There were many flight tests that would demand numerous modifications. So many that Sikorsky's mechanics affectionately nicknamed the VS-300 as Igor's nightmare. Igor Sikorsky's VS-300 was America's first successful helicopter. His design and patent became the basis for future modern helicopters. Our Army Air Force at that time became very interested in the aircraft and gave him $50,000 to finish the development of that aircraft. United Aircraft, of course, had a lot of money to that, and they developed then under Air Force contract the XR-4. And that's the aircraft that's sitting behind me is the first then production aircraft. This is one of, this is the only remaining prototype of the XR-4. By the end of World War II, over 400 Sikorsky helicopters had rolled off the assembly lines. Military leaders first thought of the helicopter as a scouting tool, but the helicopter quickly proved to be capable of much more. During the last years of World War II, many stranded victims were rescued in spots that only the helicopter could reach. The military was impressed with the life-saving potential of this new machine. The helicopter had shown that it could be a truly useful aircraft, a rotary-winged angel of mercy. In years to come, it would be that and more, in peace as well as war.
Much of the early designs were based on intuition. Well, use your best judgment and your imagination and do what you think you have to do to conceive and develop a system that will work. If it works, you made it like we did 55 years ago on the 11th of April, 1943. Frank Piasecki built and flew America's second successful helicopter, the Piasecki PV-2. Just like Igor Sikorsky before him, Piasecki's first flights in a helicopter were tethered to the ground for safety. It was a kind of a windy day, but we started a machine up and we had my mother's clotheslines I borrowed to hold the machine to the ground. And all of a sudden, a gust of wind came along, lifted me up off the ground, broke the ropes. Everybody ran away. And just by some stroke of the Lord, I moved my head in the right direction and countered the, the turn that the wind did and came back down the ground and stopped. And the machine was saved. And that was our first takeoff. Piasecki's PV-2 helicopter evolved into a fully controllable aircraft. Just like the other early helicopter pioneers, Piasecki's machine took months to perfect. Not only were engineers dealing with the unknown, but with helicopter technology being so complex and so new, gathering support for such endeavors wasn't always easy. If you said, I'm designing a helicopter, people would look upon you as a nut. It was known that it had a lot of failures by many different people and many uh, celebrated engineers. And therefore, who the hell are you that you're going to design a helicopter that will fly? So get out of my way. But by the time the clouds of World War II began to part, more than 50 companies were working at helicopter development, all hoping for a governmental contract. It was Frank Piasecki who got the attention of the Navy. Frank Piasecki designed a helicopter that had two rotors, but instead of being a lateral twin, meaning that it had rotors on each side, he put one of the main rotors at the forward end of the helicopter and the other main rotor at the aft end of the helicopter. Again, they rotated in opposite directions so that each one compensated for the torque reaction of the other. And the Navy then gave us an order for 10 of them because they wanted to try out the squadron of them. And with those 10, they were able to apply this new thing that they had, which gave them 1,800 pounds of vertical lift, which gave them more speed, which gave them more maneuverability, towing things, for instance, mine sweeping. Piasecki built several variations of tandem rotor helicopters. Shortly after World War II, they were in use with the Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. However, by August 1950, the armed forces found themselves in desperate need for hundreds of new helicopters in a war that no one expected. Without a doubt, the Korean War uh, convinced all of the skeptics because within a few months after the start of the war, the helicopter had gone to almost priority number one. It was used for medical evacuation. It began to be used for the rescue of pilots down behind enemy lines. At first, the majority of the helicopters in use were Frank Piasecki's PV-3s, more commonly known as Flying Bananas. Also in use were Igor Sikorsky's S-51 helicopters. But for medical evacuation, a smaller, lightweight helicopter was needed. The design came from a brilliant young inventor, Arthur Young, who worked for the famous Bell Aircraft Corporation. Young had built America's third successful helicopter, the Bell Model 30. This craft first flew on June 26, 1943, only two months after Piasecki had lifted off the ground for the first time. Yet two years later, after an evolution of refinements and improvements, Arthur Young churned out the Bell 47 helicopter. The Bell 47 became the symbol of hope for American soldiers during the Korean War. They soon became an integral part of MASH units, or Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals. With its bulbous plastic cockpit, the Bell 47 quickly became one of the most recognizable helicopters in the world. Its characteristic plop, 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 plop sound resulted in the coin term chopper. And by the end of the Korean War, uh, I believe the helicopter had evacuated well over 100,000 wounded troops and had what is equally significant, had rescued and brought to safety something like 1,200 pilots from behind enemy lines, men that would have faced capture, starvation, torture, and probably death if it had not been for the helicopter. 
1953, the Korean War was over, but helicopters would soon become more than scout and rescue machines. They would become a viable military weapon in a distant conflict that would become known as the Helicopter War. However, harmony between helicopters and the military in Vietnam would take a little time. Virtually all helicopters utilized piston engines, which relative to their size and weight were bulky and weak. A turbine engine has a spinning fan that sucks air into a combustion chamber where it is mixed with fuel and ignited. As the fuel burns, it produces hot gases which shoot into the turbine causing it to spin. Attached is a shaft that turns the rotor and any other devices connected to it, such as gearboxes for the rear tail rotor and power generators, etc. A reciprocating engine for the for the horsepower it delivers its weight weight to, to horsepower ratio is is generally about equal so i mean if if you had a 400 horsepower engine it's going to weigh about 400 pounds uh, in a turbine engine it's about half if you have a 400 horsepower engine it's going to weigh about 200 pounds and in a helicopter just like any aircraft weight is precious it was a turbine driven helicopter that became the symbol of the vietnam war the bell hu1 more commonly known as the huey a nickname the Army pilots came up with based on the helicopter's initials. My first few months in Vietnam was flying Hueys. I think the Huey was the most versatile helicopter in the Vietnam War. And, and like I said, I think it became one of the most versatile helicopters ever built. Just by its pure design and its capabilities, easy to train pilots for, take enough troops, a, a squad, say. Uh, you could put hard mounts on the outside of the aircraft and turn it into a gun platform if that be. You could put litters inside and, and use it as an air ambulance. You could take an aircraft and configure it very quickly for three or four or five different kind of missions. But flying these machines in war exposed both pilot and aircraft to great risk. While rescuing wounded soldiers, often from the front lines, helicopters became large moving air targets for the enemy. There was really nothing really bulletproof about a Huey other than that it was a pretty simple design and there was a few critical components and if they were hit, uh, it would knock it out of the sky. There was a lot of helicopters lost in Vietnam and a lot of helicopter pilots lost their lives in Vietnam because of just the pure exposure, just the amount of hours that were flown. But there was not a more welcome sight to American troops fighting in flooded paddies and look-alike villages than that of the Bell HU-1. The Huey was looked upon as an angel of mercy one of the most respected machines of that war. I think of the Huey affectionately because we were raised with it. In fact, I'm getting, you know, you get a little emotional just thinking about it. That pop, 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 pop. so classic of a Huey. I went from being an apprehensive manipulator of the controls to becoming a helicopter pilot in the Huey. And I think I'll just always remember that. I'm very fortunate that uh, our department operates a surplus Huey, and I occasionally get to fly it, and, and I hope it's the last helicopter I fly. I'll always have a soft spot in my, in my heart for the Huey. By the end of the Vietnam conflict, the helicopter had proven itself as an efficient and ubiquitous servant in war. But soon, the world would see that the most dramatic helicopter duty remained the same in peace as in war, rescue. Less than 20 years after the birth of the modern helicopter, the world became reliant upon its existence. I think certainly the, to the Army of the United States, and I would dare say to the armies of a number of military services around the world, the helicopter certainly is as indispensable as the jet fighter is to the air forces of the world. It does provide you simply with the capability to continue military operations in areas that would be inaccessible with anything but the helicopter. Currently, the latest in helicopter technology can be found in some of the various military machines, such as the Boeing Sikorsky Comanche. This stealth machine can fly at speeds up to 200 miles per hour and execute snap turns in 4.5 seconds. The Comanche can fly sideways or backwards at 70 miles per hour, while the pilot utilizes the craft's advanced radar and infrared sensors. In seconds, the Comanche's computers can scan miles of a battlefield, instantly prioritize all hostile targets, including tanks, trucks, and even other helicopters. While displaying the targets for crew identification, the system selects the optimum weapon to neutralize each, either from its own extensive weapon systems or by relaying encrypted information to other air or ground commanders. But the civilian side of helicopter technology is no less important. Helicopters are always on standby for our safety and benefit.
A lot of people don't realize one of the special functions of a helicopter in a large metropolitan area is when the corporate helicopters are members of a disaster relief program. And in the New York City area, for example, all the corporate helicopters that fly around not only just fly the executives around to save time and uh, bring in a lot of business to the area, which is very important for the economy, but should an unexpected disaster occur, for example, some kind of a bombing or just some kind of a national disaster, the helicopters would all rally in support of the community. And this is something that we do in addition, just as a community service. Today, I think we can say as a rough ballpark figure that well over one and a half million human lives directly saved by the helicopter, by the intervention of the helicopter. As these heavy lift Ericsson helicopters aid in power line construction, remote logging, and major equipment transportation. This unit is one of the first unmanned helicopters being developed for law enforcement in the military. Utilizing a single main rotor protected in the middle of the aircraft, this Sikorsky rotorcraft performs a variety of functions, including capturing live footage and transmitting it back to a safely isolated base station. Unmanned helicopters may one day be a common sight. Oh, the future of helicopters is absolutely exciting. Um, just a branch off from the helicopter is the tilt rotor, and that's where I think that you're going to mesh the vertical flight and horizontal flight. In fact, what it is is the tilt rotor is the best of both worlds. You can land and take off like a helicopter and have the speed and range of an airplane. Man's thirst for perfecting three-dimensional flight appears to be an unfinished quest. But whatever we achieve in the future, the helicopter will always remain our source of inspiration. The Sikorsky Boeing Future Vertical Lift is a scalable design based on proven X2 technology featuring fly-by-wire flight controls, advanced rigid rotor system, lift offset coaxial rotor, advanced drive system, active vibration control, foldable rotor system, pusher prop with clutch with active rudders and elevators, an all-composite fuselage, crew of four with a cabin for 12 combat-equipped troops, with weapons employment in all modes of flight and expanded and enhanced medevac capacity for eight litters. Sikorsky Boeing Future Vertical Lift will provide superior speed, range, and payload performance. In addition to these improvements, FEL development, sustainment, printing costs, and schedule are minimized through extensive commonality across assault and attack variants. Go straight to the bank. Left, that's gonna be left door, guys, left door. These will be the first seriously wounded Americans Barry has treated. Six one hops got his wheels up three one. So I believe it's a 
15, 20 minute flight. You know, time is always of the essence, with, especially with amputations and bleeding. It may seem like it's uh, not that long, but 30 minutes could be a serious amount of time. Two Americans in critical condition reach the NATO hospital. It's been 50 minutes since the call came in. Matt and Barry race to get the wounded men to the trauma center. Doing good, man. Keep it up. Here's the doctor I'm hey. handing him off to. Hey, how you doing? 